All right, so join me in welcoming uh, Matt Heisen, formerly known as Spike Dudley. Matt, what's happening, man? Oh, not too much. Lazy Wednesday. Did my shopping. Got a beef barley stew on the stove. Life is good. Yeah, you sound happy, man. You sound happy. I am happy. Life is good. Is it? Uh, how is life after uh, World Wrestling Entertainment? Better or worse? Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a much happier person. You know, um, the, the grind of that place really eats your soul away. You know, uh, you got to eat a lot of crap and you got to eat it with a smile. And, uh, you know, I kind of rediscovered my love for wrestling. And I'm having an absolute blast being back out in the Indies. I'm really having a good time. So, I mean, life is good. <laughs> well, I mean, when you were with them, and one of, the, one of the weird things about that company is that they seem to have this fetish for huge guys, and your entire gimmick was that you're not huge. Uh, right. Well, that's my gimmick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you think that they grasped the gist of that? Because towards the end, they were they were really kind of trying to figure out how to how to promote you. Do you think they ever really figured out uh, what was special about your character? No, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't think there's enough wrestling people making decisions back there that they can really grasp it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the, the, the TV people are strictly, oh, Hulk Hogan, oh, big guy, oh, big guy, and then they see me and they go, what the F, you know? Um, so, I, no, I don't think they ever really figured out how to use someone, you know, of my stature. You know, obviously minus the, the Rey Mysterio talent, just because he's a phenom, you know? I mean, he's easy to use. Um, I don't think they ever figured out that the... the um, the, whatever you want to call it, the Spike Dudley concept. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, you came in with a bang, man. You came in at, uh, during that big ladder match where, uh, where Rhino debuted and you debuted. And it seemed like there was all this energy to try to, to kind of beef up the, the three teams. It was Edge and Christian, uh, the Dudleys, and the Hardys. And they brought in, you know, Lita, and then they had Rhino with, uh, with Edge and Christian and you with the Dudleys. And it seemed like there was all this energy and all these things going into, uh, to get in this big three-way feud, and then next thing you know, it was kind of, uh, you were pulled out of that, you were put into the Molly Holly situation. Did you ever find, feel that you were in a uh, in a storyline that, that made it all the way through? No, absolutely not. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I got involved in a couple of storylines, but uh, regardless of how well they got over or didn't get over, it was only, okay, we'll give you a couple weeks' worth, and then we'll just put you back down on the, uh, you know, the heat velocity list. You know, and, and whatever. I, I mean, I never tried to figure out the politics of the place. I never, you know, I never went around kissing ass or begging or trying to get, you know, I just said, okay, if this is what they want me to do, I'll be happy to do whatever they tell me to do. So, I mean, I thought the Molly Holly thing was something that was a really hot angle, and they just dropped that, you know, before it even took off. Yeah. And uh, and once it happened, I said, okay, I see how this place works, so I'm just here to keep my job, and I'll do whatever they ask of me, which is what I did for pretty much the whatever four or five years I was there. See, what amazed me about the Molly Holly angle was I, I still remember uh, right before the King of the Ring uh, in 2001, they had to do the angle where Austin was running around with a petition, so you didn't right. have to fight Benoit and Jericho, and they had you in a, in a segment where you tore up the, uh, the petition because I think he called Molly a uh, bimbo, Right. It got a reaction. It was huge. It was a huge reaction. And watching it, I remember thinking, it was it was finally a spot where they, where they found a way to put you into a situation where you could fight the right opponent with the right kind of angle. Uh, and then that, too, that was gone right afterwards, too. I well, mean, you know what it is? I mean, one, if, if, so, if you can't get over working with Austin, then hang up your boots and never get in the ring again. Yeah. You know what I mean? So having him there certainly, of course, helped the angle. I think what they lacked was, okay, we had the match, and Austin kicked my ass in five minutes. What do we do from there? It's all over. Uh -huh. You know, they didn't really have any vision or foresight to, to, to continue that angle and go, hey, he can just be a scrappy guy that's, you know, just trying his best to, to, to stick up for his girl. I don't think they, they thought long-term when they did that. I thought they were just going for the cheap one-night pop, and then, okay, we got him over, now 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 forget about it. You know, um, I, I think they kind of have their list of guys they're going to push and guys they're not going to push, and if you don't fit a certain criteria, they're not going to push you. And uh, that was pretty much the experience I found. Yeah. At what point did, because uh, I ask almost everybody that comes on here, when you first got with the company, obviously everybody is excited when they first get in there. Uh, at what point did it start to become clear to you that, that maybe uh, you weren't going to be able to uh, to rise to any level that you thought you, uh, you might uh, be? The first meet? night that I, I showed up. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, I went in, I did the run, and it was actually, it was Bubba and Devon against Edge and Christian, and I did the surprise run in and cost Edge and Christian the titles, the Dudleys won the title. Uh, when the night was over, you know, they wrap up TV, it's about 11, 11.30, um, one of the higher-ups came to me and said, 
uh, Spike. The writers are having a hard time realizing that you're a wrestler, so could you please come to work in a jacket and tie so they can see that you're a wrestler and not just, you know, somebody else? And I went, okay. I mean, these people are morons. What does that, yeah, what does that even <laughs> mean? Shit I'm gonna have to deal. Oh, can, I, can I curse on this? Yeah, I'll go, go fucking crazy. Say, okay, this is the shit I'm going to have to deal with. I'll do it with a smile. So whatever, in the next couple of days I showed up with a jacket and tie and then, you know, whatever. But I mean, that's the mentality there. You know, they've got people that have no clue. They've never even watched wrestling, yet they are in charge of writing the angles and in charge of promoting and things like that. So, I mean, it, it's just such a, a giant corporation that they, it's so far removed from what pro wrestling is about. It's sports entertainment in that company and strictly sports entertainment. You know, they're, they're interested in how many video games they can sell or they you know it's almost like the shock jock radio where you know okay we can write a cute uh, rhyme or, or say boob and that that's going to get a pop and get ratings for that quarter segment hour regardless of what that does to sell tickets at the arena two weeks away you know what i mean yeah. it, it, so whatever it is what it is it's a giant corporation but it's, it's very far removed from pro wrestling See, one of the things about you is you had wrestled for uh, for ECW and uh -huh. WWE primarily. So, I mean, you went from, from really a, a company that focused so much on being a wrestling company to a company that focused so much on not being a wrestling company. What was that transition like for you? Um, it, you know, it, uh, you hit it right. When I first got the call, I was excited. ECW had folded. I was sitting there going, okay, maybe I'm going to have to go get a day job. Bam, I get a phone call. Okay, you're working in the WWF. And I went, great, you know, this is cool. But, um, yeah, that passion that, you, actually, it's not even the passion, it's the trust that you had in ECW. Um, I knew, you know, I knew what Paulie was all about. I knew what the promotion was about. I knew the guys there. Um, it was all, it was very much an all-for-one, one-for-all attitude. Everybody just wanted to go out and put out a kick-ass show. Uh, the WWE, it, it's not. It's a lot of me, 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 a lot of backstabbing, a lot of manipulation, a lot of, you know, who gets the Vince last, you know, who puts the word in Vince's here last is the guy that's going to get pushed. Mm. It's you know it's just it's too much political gaga, and uh, it, it's very much removed from what I got into the business about. You know. Yeah. So, I don't know. It, it it wasn't a hard transition because I was riding that high of man. I you know went from South Philly to uh, whatever it was the Houston Astrodome. So I mean that was all pretty amazing and things like that. But it, it's it really it's not pro wrestling anymore, which is disappointing because it, it should be. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, you spent a lot of time in, in that company, and you saw a lot of the uh, the changes, and I guess the improvements, the dress code, and and, and things like the uh, the travel changes and things like that. What was your opinion of of some of the changes that John Laurinaitis made? Well, I mean, I don't know. The dress code, I didn't really care about. So they wanted you to dress business casual. What's what's the big deal? You know that they just wanted a uh, you know. A collar and, uh, and shoes. I can live with that. You know, that that's some level of professionalism. Um, I guess what I have a problem with is that most of the guys are independent contractors. You're hired to come in and wrestle a show, yet you're told, you know, what to wear, when, when to be there, how long you've got to be there. And on top of they're trying to put us on the same level as NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, all of that, yet none of the guys make anywhere near the salaries, you know, with the exception of the, the, this elite few. And, you know, we travel in middle seat coach classes and things like that, but they want us to present ourselves like we're multimillionaires. You know, it's a real contradiction of the way they treat the talent, yet the way the talent has to, you know, present itself in, in the public. So, I mean, I, I think those, the, the changes were strictly to appease certain people in the top office, and it didn't really have any effect whatsoever on, on the product. Did we sell more tickets because guys dress nicer? No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, a lot of the, the changes were just strictly uh, ornament, you know, dressing. Oh, totally. Well, how did you feel about the, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the other main topics of WWE, uh, especially in the years since you've been there, has been the uh, the slow push towards real nepotism uh, when it comes to getting the McMahon family on TV. What was your opinion about them uh, as characters? You know, some of it was good, some of it was bad. I mean, I think Vince is awesome on TV. Uh -huh. You know, he always has been. He's got a great head for it. He knows what to say, how to say it. His facials are phenomenal. Um, you know, Shane... Shane got his the stuff over by doing the crazy extreme wrestling with, you know, Kurt Angle and, and with Kane and all that. Um, as characters, aside from Vince, I don't think any of them are really that great. 
you know, I mean, they kind of seem like low B grade actors to me, you know, so, it, I mean, them as characters, Stephanie and Linda and Shane never really did much for me as a wrestling fan. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, because you're you're known for being uh, one of the extreme uh, guys to take most of the, the big bumps. When, when Shane was doing it, and Shane was taking those 75 feet, jumping off the Titan Tron onto Blackman and all that stuff, uh, the big argument that people had was that he was then able to take off for as long as he wanted uh, in between wrestling, whereas you wouldn't be able to do that. You would have to take the bump and then come back in three days. Um, how did you feel about that, and how did other people who were in your position feel about the boss's kid kind of, you know, taking the big spot from the show and then having unlimited time to recoup. Well, I mean, I can't speak for anybody. I, I know during the last run when he was running with Kane, Shane was actually in my travel clique. Um, so I spent a lot of time with Shane. Um, you know, I agree with you that I think it's kind of bogus that they, you just bring bring one guy in, who, regardless of who the son is, but just give him all of the extreme stuff and nobody else can do anything outside the ring or over the top just so this guy can get over knowing that the guy's going to be gone in three months. I think that hurts the company. You know, I, I'm not knocking Shane for it. I'm knocking the overall decision of the WWE to, to, to push this one guy to do this is inhuman stunts that nobody could walk away from, yet he's just a guy that walks in off the street. That takes away from the credibility of the wrestlers that are there when, let's say, you know, whatever, I get power bombed through a table and I'm off TV, TV for three weeks uh, because I have to sell the injury, yet Shane comes in and takes 20 chair shots, falls 75 feet, and then comes out strutting his stuff the next day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it hurts the company. Yeah. You know, I think it hurts wrestling. Um, you know, I could care less about the individuals involved. I think it's just bad business. I mean, at this point, there seems to be no continuity with almost anything they do anymore. Well, I, I don't know. Since they fired me, I haven't really watched anything, so I couldn't tell you. But, I mean, it wouldn't surprise. There was no continuity when I was there, so um, the, the lack of it, if, that, if it is today, doesn't surprise me at all. Let me ask you this about, about uh, when, when you were released. Uh, I mean, one of the things everyone talks about it is the fact that, you know, they told you and, and the other uh, the other former Dudleys, I guess now, that you guys couldn't use your, your names outside of WWE. Uh, I mean, how do you feel about that, your, your feelings about the whole thing? Oh, I think it's rubbish. You know, that, that, that's, that's a, just a kick in the nuts. You know, because we all had created our characters well before we got to the WWF. They hired us because of those characters we created, you know, separate from the WWF. And then they go, hey, we own you. You can't use it anymore. That, it's, that's just kicking us in the nuts. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a real slap in the face for three guys that literally put their bodies on the line and spend more time in the ambulances and hospitals getting fixed up and coming back the next night. You know, we really were the, the, the soldiers of that group, we, you know, willing to take any bump, willing to do anything that they ask of us. And then to, to turn around and treat us like that is just a total disregard and lack of respect for what we accomplish, especially those guys. I mean, they, they, they raised the bar, Bubba and Devon, with those TLC matches. Um, to, to, to do that is just, it's cold. That's not surprising. I mean, that that's the least of the things that they've done to me. But it, it's just, it's like kind of like the final slap in the face. Well, was there anything, though, that, I mean, you ever did? That's something that, that I ask everybody that comes on here. I mean, were you ever involved in anything where you had to be disciplined or you felt that maybe it was... Uh, it was done for, for a reason, uh, any reason like that you could possibly think of that this was done for? Not with me. I mean, uh, Bubba and Devon had, had, you know, were in a much higher spot than I was, and, uh, you know, they had more confrontations than I did. Uh, I was more or less the team player. I just wanted to get along. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd come in and do whatever they, they, they asked of me, and, uh, you know, I'd question, isn't that kind of stupid? And everyone would say, yeah, but that's what they want. I'd say, okay, well, fine, I'll go do it. Um, can I pinpoint one particular incident why they would want to want to fuck me? No, I can't, and I still can't understand why they would want to fuck with me. But they have, and that's the way it is. So, <laughs> do you think the mentality is that you're going to come back uh, because you would have no choice later on down the line because they have your name, or do you think it's just a matter of they want to make money off of you without having you on contract? Well, I don't see how they could make money off me. You know. Well, I mean, the figure Whether I'm there or not, I mean, if they have to go and do their ECW things, I'll still get my royalties from that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what was the, say that question again, there was a part I... 
No, I mean, do you think that it was done so that you wouldn't really have a choice down the line, that you would have to return to them? And oh, no. You know, like, because, I, one, I don't expect them ever to ask me back, and, two, I, I really have serious reservations as to whether I would ever go back or not. I mean, there, there's there's more nobility in flipping burgers for a living than there is to eat their crap again. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I would have real second thoughts about ever going back to work for them. So I don't think they're trying to hold an ace up their sleeve or anything like that. Um, I think they're just trying to... to protect the entire product and go, anybody that worked here can't ever use that name again unless it's under the WWE. And I, I don't know if it strictly applies to the Dudleys or just everybody in general. Um, but I'm not, you know, going back there is not really a concern for me. <laughs> well, here, here's what got me about that is the fact that since they took away your name and they said that you worked here and now you can't use it, uh, don't you look at it more as that's a kind of a way of pushing people almost away from going to WWE, maybe pushing them towards TNA, when they can think to themselves, well, if I'm going to build up a name, and they're just going to take it from me at the end anyway, I might as yeah, well work Yeah, but look at it this way. I mean, the, the WWE is the only major play. I mean, I'm not knocking TNA, but they're not anywhere close to the, 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 the financial you know, monstrosity that the WWE is. Um, they've so eliminated the rest of the talent that they figure that the only place anybody can make a living is with them. So it's play by our rules or you're out of the business. Yeah. Now, you know, TNA is, is certainly a, a breath of fresh air, and I hope to God that they do well and, and can get going on a, you know, a full-time basis where everybody can make big paychecks. But at this point, I mean, they're not even close to the, the money level that the WWE is at. Mm -hmm. So I think they just look at it as we're the only player. It's play by play for us or play for no one. No, but I mean, what I'm asking is that I mean, I I, I totally agree with you about TNA. I mean, I think they're a good alternative. I don't know. They're definitely not at the point where they're going to challenge them yet. Uh, but what I'm saying is, do you think that it's little things like this that WWE is actually going to start giving people reasons uh, to go there? I mean, because before, whereas it's just one money against the other money, now it's little things that you could add on to, like, well, they're going to take away my name, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Uh, do you think that they're not really realizing that they're kind of pushing people away from working for them or, or watching their product? Um, yeah, there might be that, but look at it like this. You know, before they eliminated everybody, stars would build up their names in other promotions, ECW, WCW, whatever it was. And then they would come to the WWF with a name. Since there isn't really any place to develop a, a national name anymore, they figure they're just going to create their own stars which is why they, you know, get rid of a lot of veteran talents and, and you know, just take their, their guys from Ohio that they've been training for a year and say, these are this is strictly our talent. Everything WWE is going to be WWE produced, homegrown WWE talent. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't think they, they look at any other place as an option to, to become a name. You know, I think yeah. nowadays they think we're the only place you can, you can get on TV. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do, who knows? I mean, you know what? I'm not there for those, their, their idiot meetings <laughs> and when they make their idiot decisions. You know, I, I, I sit there and, and, and flabbergasted as you when, they, when, when this stuff comes out. Um, so what, what is their rationale? I have no idea because it doesn't really seem to make sense to me or to anybody else that I know in the business. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know what amazes me, man? It's that... Now that, uh, I mean, I've been doing the show for a few weeks now, whenever we have people on who have left WWE, even, uh, you know, people like yourself who never really had uh, any, any problems with the company while you were there, uh, they're releasing all these people, and they're giving them so much animosity on the way out. Well, I remember back in, during the WCW war, many of the people who were leaving WCW were going to WWE, citing the fact that they had such high morale in their locker room, and that was one of the big selling points to make them go there. Uh, and now you talk to people, and it sounds like this, this chamber of horrors backstage. I mean, oh, it is. what happened, man? Uh, I couldn't really tell you what happened. Um, I can tell you morale is horrible. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm still friends. I still talk with everybody that's back there, and, and nobody's happy with anything that's going on there. Was it like that the whole time you were there? Or did you see No, but it definitely was on the turning end. You know what I mean? Like, wrestling peaked out. Uh, it was just coming off the Stone Cold, Mick Foley, you know, rock run as I was getting in. And as they, those guys slowly moved out, um, morale definitely kicked down. I mean, who knows? Maybe it was the Hunter Factor or whatever you want to call it. But uh, morale has, has seeped down to nothing. You know, like nobody's happy. Yeah, you know, it's pro wrestling. How can, you, how can it not be a fun place to show up and work? Yet, you know, my last few months there, I was a miserable prick. Yeah. I hated it, you know, it was, and, and, and I mean, I'm living a dream at 
I'm making a living being a pro wrestler, and I was miserable going to work. That's insane. It makes no sense. Well, well, what is your opinion of, uh, I mean, you said the Hunter factor. What, what's your opinion of Triple H and his position in the company? Hey, you know what? I always got along great with Hunter, um, but I think there's, you know, if you're a talent and you have all the power, not really anything good can happen as a result of that. You know, again, I'm not there. I've heard tons of stories about stuff that's happened, but, I mean, I, I'm not actual witness to the inside meetings, so I can't come out and bury him particularly, but, you know, it, it's obvious that, you know, who has stroke and who doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and if you don't have stroke, you're not going to be there very long. It's amazing. Well, what was, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that might have uh, spiked morale, and it seemed to for a little while, because the show seemed to get a little bit better, was the, uh, the ECW uh, infusion that they tried to do last June. What was the feeling around there, and how did you feel about the ECW one night, uh, one night stand? I fucking hated it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was not anything I wanted any part of. Um, I. It was not anything I was happy about. Um, I. It was probably. It, and actually, it's funny because that was the last show I worked for the WWE. And anybody that was there saw me for four hours just sitting in a chair with my head hung low. I was as miserable as I could ever be uh, attending that show. Really? Um, I wanted nothing to do with it. ECW really was about going F-U-W-C-W, F-U-W-W-F. Uh -huh. How can you have an ECW pay-per-view that's owned by Vince? Yeah. And it, it, it's just the thought sickened me. And one of the things that it was circulating was that it's only going to be ECW, it's only going to be ECW. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a completely WWF show. Yep. You know, and, and, and the only thing they used was, okay, we're going to sell a bunch of buy rates and we're going to get the WWE guys over. You know, it was it was it was horrifying. I the only reason I I, I even showed up was that that Paul asked me to. Uh -huh. You know, and that was it. Um, aside from that, I knew that if you weren't a WWE contracted guy and you were one of the ECW guys coming in, you were just going to get fucked with, and they fuck with those guys bad. Um, it, it, they, they just, they, it was horrible. I was horrifying. I, I was miserable. I didn't want anything to do with it. And, uh, and to be honest, that was it. <laughs> I just, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. It, it kind of struck me as, I mean, that whole period was kind of rewriting the history of what ECW was. Uh, McMahon trying to imply that, that, you know, he was the one. I mean, regardless of whether or not he was helping, you know, financial support, right around the time that pay-per-view came out, it kind of seemed like it was all done so he can uh, kind of swing his balls around and tell the world that he was uh, financially supporting them. Uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. I mean, that, you know, you can make your own take on that. I, you know, I didn't really pay attention to a lot of the promos and things like that, that they were doing leading up to it. So, uh, you know... I don't know. I mean, maybe it was. I mean, they were just trying to, to make money off of it. Everything's about dollars and cents to them. And they looked at it as, okay, we can do this ECW thing and make a fortune off it. And they did. Mm -hmm. um, why? Well, strictly money, you know. Their pay-per-view sucks, so let's get an ECW pay-per-view in and, and sell some buy rates, you know. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. This is a, an, an unrelated uh, subject. You're a former uh, school teacher that, mm -hmm. that became a wrestler. Uh, one of the more famous ones, you, you did the uh, the spot in, uh, was it Beyond the Mat? The yeah, when I misquoted Shakespeare. Yep, <laughs> yep. Um, how did you feel about Matt Stryker earlier this year, the uh, the teacher turned wrestler who, who took time off uh, to go do a tour of Japan but, but cited that it was uh, a personal day or something to that effect, but uh, more or less kind of gave uh, false reasons for his time off from teaching so he could do wrestling, and then WWE signed him. How did you feel about him and, and the way he handled himself? Uh, I don't really know any of the details other than what you just said. Oh, okay. Um, you know, what it sounds like to me is he was a guy that had a day job to support his wrestling habit, and he got caught. You know, the day job can only put up with the crap so long, and they fired him. Yeah. Um, I mean, after I left teaching, I had to go and work an office job, and I would lie to them every Friday to, to get out of work early to go wrestle for ECW. And after a year, they finally caught me and said, hey, you know, we can't have this anymore. It's us or them. And I said, fine, I quit. You know, I think that's any sacrifice that any, you know, anybody that's paying dues, you, you have to have a day job, as I said, to support your wrestling habit. But if you really love wrestling, wrestling's going to win out and you're going to, you know, slack off at your day job. Um, in terms of, well, I don't get what you said, WW hired him because? Oh, I mean, because of the controversy that was created for it. Um, 
they were just trying to like take advantage of. The well, I mean, news? you pretty much answered it with, with what you said. I mean, as far as uh, I mean, I always thought it was interesting because it, it's not really. Uh, I mean, it's not such a different position, but it kind of is a different position to go from. I think you taught third grade, right? For two years, yep. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that it's definitely a, a different thing. People don't expect to hear, uh, you know, a third grade teacher going into uh, to extreme uh, championship wrestling is kind of a. Uh, a weird transition there. Have you met any of your students since those days? Since uh, the uh, I had no, because I was in California and I'm back on the East Coast now. But um, one of them did email me a few months, or actually a couple of years ago. Um, so she was third grade then. She, she must have been eight or nine, and now she was like in her sophomore year of college. Oh wow! And uh, some, you know, she was watching wrestling or something like that, and, and oh my God, that's Mr. Heisen. And uh, she looked me up on the internet and, and emailed me, and you know, told me how much she had fun with me, you know, and I was there as a teacher and things like that. And it, that was pretty neat. Yeah. But uh, the only one student got in touch with me. Well, I'm sure I see you. If you had to pick anybody right now uh, in the current wrestling scene, WWE, TNA, anywhere there is, uh, that you think has the potential to be a, a big breakout star, uh, who would you pick? Oh, boy. Yeah. I, I, that's a tough question. Yeah, um, abstract question. <laughs> Uh, mostly because I haven't really watched any uh, WWE. I don't really know any of their young, their young guys, you know, other than guys that I used to see at the house shows and things like that occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, man, I think the top guy. I mean, you could pick uh, anybody you've seen recently uh, that you think has, has potential. Whether you saw them uh, on on the Indies or, or anywhere else, that, that you think uh, that you think has uh, has potential. You know, that's a really hard question. I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of today's indies workers, today's younger wrestlers, are so concerned about the moves. Yeah. Um, how spectacular their triple Lindy DDT is and things like that. And there's very little focus on the emotional aspect of it, on the, uh, on the promos, on grabbing an audience by the balls and not letting them go. Um, a lot of the indies I've seen are just kind of like giant collection of high spots. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, there's tons of talent. I mean, there's unbelievable. These guys are doing stuff that, that's just insane. But I've never been one to go, okay, just doing crazy moves is enough to get you over. Um, I haven't seen a lot of work on the promos. And to be honest, today's influx of young wrestlers are all like 200 pounds or around there. I haven't seen many of like the really big guys. Um, that are have broken that are in the business. Um, so I mean, to pick out any one and go, that's a breakout star. I don't know because I haven't really seen the full potential. I haven't seen their promos and their mic work, and and that's a real important part of it. See, what you're actually saying is something that I've heard from a lot of people. Do you think that the problem uh, with a lot of the young guys today is that they they kind of gravitated towards you know the Rey Mysterios and and kind of the Jeff Hardy type of quality of wrestling, uh, but never really grasped what it was about it uh, that made it special. They just saw the high spots for what they were and, and just focused on that? Yeah, I mean, well, of course, since, I mean, since the, uh, you know, since Vince took over everything and bought out everybody and wrestling went mainstream and there's only been two groups, um, that, you know, the old school feel is gone. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, as a fan, like today's fans don't really hate the, the, the bad guys and don't, really love the good guys um, there isn't that emotional attachment um, and it's as you say it's I don't know man it's kind of hard to describe without getting into a big monologue about it but uh, I, I know what I mean you yeah. need an emotional attachment um, or an emotional connection between the wrestlers and the fans and if all you're doing is going move 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 there's never that emotional connection yeah. And I think a lot of today's wrestling fans have grown up without that emotional attachment. They just go, oh, wow, he went through a table, or oh, wow, you know, he 619. And I'm not knocking Ray, right? I think Ray is an awesome wrestler, um, just an example of a move. Yeah. Um, but they don't have that, oh, my God, the good guy's got to win, or, or did, you know, like they, they don't have that love, that passion that old school pre k fabe wrestling used to bring about. Yeah. And because they know nothing about it, it's tough to, to train them in that. What do you think it would take to get it back to the way it was? <laughs> uh, you'd have to erase the last 30 years and, and bring back kayfabe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, as long as it's sports entertainment, as long as, as we come out and go, hey, this ain't real, <laughs> you know, this is just a fake fight, um, you're never going to have that emotional attachment again. 
No, I agree with you. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's definitely changed. Uh, it's there. You know, like, you, what you need really is, like, that mainstream person, be it, like, you know, when John Cena came in doing the rapping thing, man, he hit a vein. And people went nuts for it, you know. You need somebody that has both, uh, a, a good, a, you know, one, they have to be a quality wrestler, but they have to have something that, that touches a nerve with the audience. You know, and what that is, who knows? Because who the hell knows what? I mean, every, everybody that comes along, be it a Rock or a Mick Foley or an Austin, you know, did anybody see that coming six months before they became a big star? No. Just something comes along and they hit a nerve. It was all, uh, yeah, no, I was just talking to, uh, I think it was Pritch, we had Tom Pritchard on a few weeks ago and he was saying that, uh, you know, they don't even know what they're looking for until they find it. It kind of just. No, they don't. They're throwing shit against the wall and hope it sticks. Yeah, and right now they just have a room full of shit. <laughs> Well, I won't go that far, but you said it. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, why don't you give us some uh, some of the shows you have coming up? I know you're doing uh, some upcoming indie shows. Well, the one that, uh, that's coming up this Saturday, which I'm actually very excited about, is called the Queen City Bash in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's uh, for a great group. That's uh, All proceeds go to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, and if you're not in the area, there's actually an auction online. If you go to queencityclash.com, uh, there's a number of, of items up for bid. Um, all, again, all proceeds go to Cystic Fibrosis. If you see something you like, please bid on it because it goes to a great group. Um, I'll tell you what, let me draw up my little event schedule here. Right. Hang on a second. Computers, I hate the freaking things. No, no, so what we'll do is we'll put a link to on the site. If you guys are listening to this, uh, right now what we're going to do is we're going to put up a link uh, on the radio. Hold on, the Radio Free Insanity page, and then you guys can click on it and, uh, and take a look at the site uh, that Matt was just talking about. Right, um, and then on uh, December 16th, I'm in Rome, Georgia. I know you had Vince Russo on last week. Yep. Uh, we're doing a show, I, what's it called, Quest for Glory? Bring the Ring of Glory. Yep. Um, and that's going to be a big show. There's a lot of big names on that. Uh, December 17th, NYWC Wrestling in Deer Park Community Center, Long Island. Are you really uh, going to be out there? What's that? That's right near where I am. Oh, you should come out. I definitely will, then. Yeah, that's Mikey's group. It's a great group. Really good talent. Um, great group of guys. Mikey Whipwreck, I man. If you guys oh. didn't <laughs> put that together. Um, but the guys I've been doing, uh, I've been working for them pretty full time for a long time. Um, December 28th, Edison, New Jersey for, uh, East Coast Pro Wrestling. Uh, December 30th, Adams, Massachusetts, Top Rope Wrestling, and it just goes on. January 7th, EWF Wrestling, that's in uh, Marion, Indiana. Um, I mean, I just go to my website, how's that? MattHyson.com, go to the dates, I've got dates all over the place. Um, I'm actually having a real good time with all these indies, uh, you know, just having... A, Last and find is the the wrestling's really great live in the small arenas, mm -hmm. and uh, I so miss that passion. And I'm just having such a good time going back and wrestling in front of only a few hundred versus thousands. You know, well, I mean, you sound happy. Plus, you I mean, you still have a a ton of dates ahead of you. So I mean, it doesn't sound like you're you're uh, you're suffering all that much. Uh, no, I mean, yeah. suffer, shit, they set me free. Hell yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, you know, there's, there's no suffering. Um, life goes on and life, life is better without the, the, the bullshit, you know? Um, man, I don't miss it. I can tell you, like, I had a miserable summer, that 90-day no-compete clause. I sat and brooded for those three months going, oh, what am I going to do? I don't have my job anymore. And then I realized, I don't need that effing job. Yeah. I really don't. I'm having a great time on the indies, and, uh, and, and I keep saying the same thing, but life is good. Awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you so much, man, for being on. Hey, no problem. And, uh, and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Absolutely.